Hey everyone, we're just going to uh, take a moment here and wait for folks to show up. Looks like we've got 107 attendees and counting. Just give it a few minutes and we'll get started. And if folks want to um, type into the chat where they're from, uh, we'd love to we'd love to hear who's here and where you're from. Um, North House and the Cook County Historical Society, we're really honored to have be have such a great circle of community gather and to hear Fish House stories. This is fantastic. Looks like they can hear you, Greg. I think they can hear you too, which is good. All right, we've sort of uh, leveled off at about 112, so I think we can get get moving here uh, tonight. Welcome everybody, this is uh, Stories from the Scott Fish House. Um, and my name is Matt, I'm the Facility Director at North House. Uh, and with us tonight, we have uh, an illustrious cast. Um, we've got Brian Tofty, uh, who it helps establish the North Shore Commercial Fishing Museum at Tofty and has spent over three decades interviewing, documenting the life of North Shore and Isle Royal commercial fishermen. Brian currently serves on the Cook County Historical Society Board. Uh, also, Mike Lovato, uh, a historical architect with the Minnesota Histo Architecture and Engineering Firm, uh, LHB. He has worked on a wide variety of historic projects all over the state and on the West Coast. He studied architecture at the University of Michigan and architecture and historic preservation at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Recently, he coordinated a team of historians and engineers that completed the Historic Structure Report, or HSR, uh, for the Scott Fish House. Of course, Katie Clark, Director of Operations of Cook County Historical Society, and Greg Wright, uh, Executive Director of North House Folk School. Um, before we get underway, I uh, just wanted to do a, a little bit of housekeeping. You know, so a lot of people have experienced Zoom by this point in the pandemic, but uh, just a quick reminder, if people aren't familiar with this format, uh, you've shown up, so you're off to a really good start. Uh, the, the next piece is that uh, there is a couple different options for responding to or asking questions. If you have just a comment, you know, like where you're from, uh, chat is a great option at the bottom of the screen. Otherwise, uh, any specific questions that you want one of the panelists to answer, you can just direct to uh, the Q&A section. And those won't be answered necessarily right away, but we'll kind of, as a moderator, I will put them in some particular order. And at the end of the presentation, we'll try to get to those. I'll call on the different uh, folks who might be able to answer those. So again, chat for general comments and uh, you know sharing stories or, or whatever else. Uh, but then specific questions you want answered, please put them in the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, there's going to be uh, a lot of interest in what's going on tonight. So uh, we'll see what we can do in the time allotted. Uh, with that, I think, Brian, I'm going to hand it over to you um, for your part. OK, I'll share my screen there. Let me know when you can see that. Yep, we can see it, Brian, looks good. Very good, I'm gonna start. 
stop the video here. Okay. Um, I put it into presentation mode, but it's not going. So let's see. There we go. All right. Um, you know, I come from a long line of, of storytellers. So when they asked, told me it was going to be 25 minutes, I, I was concerned. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to give a brief uh, history of the commercial fishing on the North Shore. Um, you know, to start with, um, as we know, you know, really the earliest uh, fishing operations on Lake Superior were conducted by the Ojibwe long before the European settlers occurred, you know. And in my family, you know, we often say we founded the little town of Tofty and, you know, as a settlement, you know, and, and I'm constantly reminded that we came long before <laughs> um, the Native Americans uh, showed up on the shore of Lake Superior. But the American Fur Company, <clears throat> excuse me, um, were really the first, uh, you know, documented, registered uh, commercial fishermen on Lake Superior. The American Fur Company was founded by, you know, John Jacob Astor in um, in 1908, and and you know he 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 was known to be the first American millionaire. <clears throat> uh, in 1834, um, about the time he was retiring, the American Fur Company established you know, commercial fishing operations <clears throat> on Lake Superior, you know, to supplement the the company fur trading profits, which were dwindling at that time. And then in 1835, Ramsey Crook, Crooks, who was the Northern Division Manager of the American Fur Company, moved their company headquarters from Mackinac Island to La Pointe uh, on Madeline Island in, in Wisconsin, Wisconsin's Apostle Islands. So that was really the first um, start. And, you know, after that, he, he commissioned fishing camps on Grand Portage and Fond du Lac and, of course, Isle Royal, which you see here. There's quite a few, as you can see, fishing settlements on Isle Royal that are documented well. Um, ultimately, the enterprise failed, uh, primarily due to a financial panic, not because they weren't catching a lot of fish. They're catching thousands of barrels of fish. But it doomed the operation, uh, and they had to declare bankruptcy in, in 1842. And, and actually, quite honestly, after the American Fur Company, it it really didn't have any commercial fishing didn't have any significant presence on Lake Superior again until the 18 mid 1850s and then to the 1870s. Um, one of the things that that um, Crooks did was he needed a way to transport fish and supplies. So he had um, several schooners constructed, you know, which the, the paintings by Howard Sievertson, that's the only way we can imagine what they might've looked like, <laughs> um, which include the 112 ton John Jacob Astor and the William Brewster. And they used those to carry cargo from Lake Superior fisheries on Isle Royal and Grand Portage. And, and they actually had a, a station in Graham Ray as well. Um, but that, that was their primary purpose is to pick up fish and then to transport that fish from La Pointe uh, back to their original headquarters in, on Mackinac there. Then the other presence um, or the other thing that made a big difference uh, for commercial fishing on, on the North Shore was the La Pointe Treaty, you know, in 1854. Once, you know, the, that was ceded to the United States, you know, the entire North Shore, Lake Superior, was available, you know, primarily to white speculators who were really quick to come into the area to find minerals like gold and copper. And then uh, within a year of the treaty, in 1855, Richard Godfrey, and who was an agent of the Northwest Exploring Company, established the first fishing station and dock at Grand Marais because of the natural harbor, uh, which where boats could come into. Um, then in 1871, 
early 1870s, I should say, Henry Mayhew and Samuel Hornstein settled on the bay in Graham Ray and ended up purchasing most of the land um, on the harbor there. Uh, they, they built warehouses and docks and um, they actually established the first commercial fishery, or I guess it'd be the second commercial fishery of whites that were settling the land in, on the North Shore. Then um, within a short period of time, they already started to do improvements on the harbor. And this kind of is back in the 1873 area, 1874. Uh, Mayhew himself operated a two-story trading post, uh, post office and school, and had uh, fish houses and a dock. And, and that's ultimately uh, where we will see pictures coming up of where these large drafted steamships would come to you know, deliver, bring passengers and pick up fish. Um, and again, like I said, it went through a, a number of improvements, um, including dredging, <laughs> you know, back in the 1880s. So they dredged the harbor, um, removed a lot of the sand and gravel, which they ultimately sold, <laughs> interestingly enough. Um, then, you know, May, uh, Henry Mayhew, you know, built the uh, the dock, and then the lighthouse was also built in 1885. But again, um, remembering that there were no people living on the North Shore, you know, up to this point in time. Then the other hugely significant change to commercial fishing on the North Shore, actually all of Lake Superior, was in 1870 when the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad um, was built, uh, which connect, connected St. Paul to Duluth, and which provided you know, expanded markets for Lake Superior fisheries, and, uh, and they could ship their product to um, distant markets. You know? And that's what the, that, has what, that was what plagued the fishermen on the North Shore up to that point, was there's no way to get their fish in, you know, in a way to people, you know, and had still have it fresh, I guess. Um, you know, the other factor that came into play during that time was um, they were developing refrigerated, you know, cars, uh, techniques for freezing fish. So the, the fresh fish could be sold in Minneapolis or St. Paul, Chicago, and, and out east. Uh, and it also brought, um, the Scandinavian immigrants um, begin, beginning at that time in the 1870s. And of course, this marked the, the beginning of a flood of um, Norwegians, Swedes, and Finns to Minnesota, which we all know about. Um, and, and again, at that time, because the railroads brought the people and the, the immigrants and, and the distribution network, um, it also evoked the passenger and freight steamers to start you know, plying the waters of Lake Superior. And, and that was as early as 1871, you know, steamships would go up the North shore and, and pick up fish from the fishermen primarily. It wasn't a lot of tourist trade per se at that time, but as you can see on the screen, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't too long after that, that they started to bring those passengers traveling up by train to the different um, towns and ports along the North Shore. And they had regular scheduled um, service, you know, so it was, it was, it, it changed just about everything. So, um, and then in the late 1880s and early 1900s, several fish companies, including um, the Chicago you know, fish company, A. Booth and Sons, uh, were competing around the lake and operating steamers to pick up the fish and supplies. And it, it's important to know that at this time, there were, there were lots of steamers. There was, there was a lot of activity happening on the, on the lake and a lot of competition. Um, those would be people like the Johns family on Royal, uh, who had large steamers and 
Sam Johnson, you know, um, some big fish companies that ended up um, working out of Duluth and continued to for, for years and years. Uh, but, but the Booth Company captured the majority of the trade. Um, they offered the fishermen um, settling on the North Shore um, all the supplies they needed, the nets, the materials, the rope, the wood for boats, uh, and all that. So they, they remained the primary um, fish company. H having said that, you'll learn here in a moment, <laughs> uh, a lot more competition was coming. So, um, you know, Bo Booth had a, a lot of different steamships, you know, a lot. <laughs> And, and they worked both the North and South Shore. Um, they had, you know, boats, you know, the A Booth, the Hunter, the TH Camp, which brought the Nelsons to Lutzen Resort, and the Herman Dixon, which brought my family and most of the 1890 settlers, the, la the vast majority of them. Um, and then, you know, Booth continued to bring boats on like the CW Moore and the Bonamia and the Easton and, and then eventually the America, which you see here in the picture. But the, the picture on the upper right is the steamer Dixon. Um, and again, that's how my family came in the late 1890s, as well as most all families in that period of time. But I, I, took, I chose another picture of Howard Sievertson's uh, painting that he did um, for, for us here in Tofty that depicts um, a cow about to be um, led off the boat, pushed overboard, and made to swim to shore. Uh, you know, chicken, cattle, horses. My family had logging camps as well as many other families. So horses. And it was, I have, during my 30 years of interviewing, it, it's kind of hard pressed to find a, a family that came in the 1890s that didn't tell me a story about how cows and uh, horses were, were walked out on a plank blindfolded and led to shore. <laughs> There's a ton of stories and they're all a little bit unique. It's kind of kind of interesting, but I'll tell you a quick little story that when we were growing up um, because of the storytelling in our family, we were told that how ice cream first came to Tofty. Uh, so the, the scenario is, is that the cow was, was pushed overboard, put in the barn. And after dinner, my uncles went to milk the cow and out came ice cream. <laughs> so a lot of, some of the stories are, are far-fetched, but they're fun. Then the, the Mackinac sailboat um, were prevalent dur even during the um, fur trade times. But, uh, but I'm speaking now to a time when, again, in the late 1890s, when these Scandinavian, largely Scandinavian families um, came to the North Shore, they started to build their own Mackinac sailboats. Um, as my family did as well. So um, the, the sailboats were needed to fish for the trout, which were the trout and white fish were the primary fish that were fished all the way up, all the way through, but herring didn't actually come into play until like around 1905, 1907. Um, but anyway, the, they needed to have these boats. So our family you know, built the boat from the wood that was on the land uh, they did what was called whip sawing. They would uh, have one man above and one man below in a pit, and they would hand saw the lumber for the boat and you know, the white pine and the cedar and those types of things. But these boats were, um, you know, meant to take you out into deep water, which is about 10 or 15 miles out into the lake to fish, you know, hook lines and deep water trout nets. Um, they were generally 25 to 30 to 35 feet, you know, in length. They're flat bottom, had pointed bows and, and sterns. Um, th they say that the they were kind of patterned after the, the Voyager's canoes. Um, I, I've heard that multiple times. I've read it multiple times. Um, the bow, you know, was much fuller than the stern. And it usually had a shallow keel with a centerboard in it. And, and I'll explain that here in a minute. But um, again, when my family came, um, it, it was a man by the name of Hans Singleson, uh, who was my grandfather's brother-in-law, who was largely the boat builder of, of the Toft area. But again, up and down the shore, these 
most families built their own boats. Um, there weren't a lot of boat builders at that time. Um, but the one that we had had a centerboard uh, with a piece of steel plate about two and a half feet wide, maybe five or six feet long with a slot in the keel and a box built over the uh, over the top of the boat, you know, level with the water. And a small chain was fastened to each end and a plate was put in place and they could be lowered or raised once they got out there. So when they're underway, uh, they would lower the kilo and to keep the boat from drifting, basically. Um, they would put like five or 600 pounds of rocks <laughs> in the boat when they left for ballast. And then when they got to the nets, they, they literally just threw the rocks overboard because they had, an un, you know, lots of rocks to get rid of, you know. And then, because I knew that they were going to catch lots of fish and that would make up that difference in weight. Um, there, Chris Tormanson, who wrote the book uh, Tofty back a long time ago, he's a commercial fisherman. He fished with our family, came from Norway with our family uh, when he was a young boy. He said they would catch two to 3,000 pounds of lake trout uh, on an outing. So, and at that time they're getting three cents a pound um, but as the demand for trout grew, um, it, it, the price raised little by little. Uh, then in, in around December 15th, the steamships would stop. They'd be iced in in the Duluth Harbor, of course, and they couldn't get up the shore. But our family and many other families on the North Shore would continue to fish because it was open as it is today. And they would load the sailboat with uh, salted fish and sail to Knife River and, and, and ship it on the Duluth and Iron Range Railroad you know, to get it to Duluth. And then they pick up supplies and groceries and sail home. And this is you know, common again up and down the North Shore. The methods of fishing uh, on the North Shore remain the same throughout the time. Uh, they had hook lines, which I mentioned earlier, where you'd go out, you know, and this happened in Isle Royal, obviously a lot, but you would sail out you know, 15, 20 miles and set these hook lines, which were baited with a small herring. So of course you had to get the herring, you know, prior to going out onto the lake. There's always a lot of work as you know, in commercial fishing and, or they would use bottom gill nets, um, you know, for trout primarily. And, and you know, there's a whole series of, of changes that happened in the netting, you know, from linen and cotton for herring and trout. And, you know, to nylon and then to monofilament over the years, but there's a tremendous amount of work to maintain these, these nets uh, along the way. Then, um, you know, meeting the boat was, was imagine, you know, three or 400 commercial fishermen on the North shore from Duluth to Thunder Bay. Uh, and these steamships would come up and uh, their deep draft is they couldn't come close to shore. So and depending on what time of the day, um, they had to roll these 100 pound kegs of fish out to the boat and load them you know, from their little skiff. Um, you've probably all heard many stories about that as well, but um, the, in Tofty and Hovland and, and a few other places, the towns decided to build uh, deep drafted docks for deep, deep drafted boats. That changed everything for the people living around Tofty and living around Oveland, um, and of course in Grand Bay, this wasn't an issue because uh, they had the Mayhew dock there. But if, if on the bottom right, bottom left, I'm sorry, there's, this is Lutzen Resort, the, the original Lutzen Resort, um, you know, burned three times, unfortunately, but it shows the men build and children building the, the dock. They're all wood crib docks. Um, and if you look on the far, bottom right hand corner. This is a picture of, of um, kind of what's left of a, a crib dock. So basically they'd build a little Lincoln log um, scenario and they'd float those out and then fill them with rocks until they you know, built up enough to get above the water. And then later on they poured concrete and things like that. But the, that, that made a huge difference obviously because they didn't have to row out in these small boats um, you know, to transport their fish. And then of course, weather was forever a problem um, on the North Shore in particular. 
you know, the notorious fierce winds that, that swept over, you know, came out of the Northwest. Um, it, was the, it was the one that was feared the most by the fishermen and where most of the fishermen lost their lives. Uh, they were simply blown out on into the lake and many froze to death and drowned and over the years. Uh, the suddenness of the violence of these Northwest winds caught many uh, by surprise, including my grandfather, which I'll mention here in a minute. But um, in, in, the, in the briefest moment, uh, the weather would change. And all these pictures were taken by commercial fishermen, by the way. There, uh, one was on the left was from Isle Royal. Um, you know, it, it, any misjudgment, which the misjudgment in effect really wasn't a misjudgment. It was beautiful sunny days. And, and as we all know how the weather can be on the North Shore, it just changed uh, completely. So then that brings us to the Coast Guard station in Grand Marais was, was established in 1928. And of course, there was 30 years prior to that where people didn't have any help of, of the Coast Guard. Uh, and this article on the, on the right is a, is a story that's printed in 1901 by a fish company called the Johns Fish Company. And they're, they're based out of IRL and had offices in Duluth. But they published this story in 1901 where my grandfather was swept out into the lake uh, for 36 hours in, a, in one of these gales. Uh, everybody assumed he was dead. Uh, he had an identical twin brother, John, who never gave up faith. <laughs> he actually climbed to the top of Carlton Peak behind Tofty and, and sat with his telescope and watched for him. Um, and somehow, miraculously, you know, he returned. And of course, he was not in great shape. But, um, you know, he spent 36 hours bailing out a wooden boat. And again, he was caught in short sleeve shirts, because he went out and it was a beautiful sunny day, like many of the stories that we hear along the North Shore, uh, this is how it happens. Um, just gets you by surprise, you know. Then uh, I said earlier that the, the large steamship companies uh, all of a sudden had lots of competition. <laughs> uh, so between 1907 and 1924, there was uh, what we call locally the Mosquito Fleet, which was a fleet of gasoline launches um, who operated mostly out of two harbors. And many of them were fishermen that, that um, chose to start picking up fish and selling them you know, to the fish companies ultimately. Uh, but as far as we've documented, there's 17 uh, that make up this fleet. And, and the reason they call them Mosquito Fleet was they all left the harbor in the morning out of two harbors, like a swarm of mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, but they would just go up and down the North Shore, well, up the North Shore, and they'd pick up fish until they got full, and then they would return to two harbors and put them on the train or, or return to Duluth. Um, but the Booth Company, which I mentioned earlier, and the H. Christensen and Son was another significant um, large fish dealer who, who worked with most of the families up and down the North Shore. Um, they, you know, by, by 1910, roughly, uh, there are about a dozen fish companies that bought from more than 300 commercial fishermen, you know. So this is a big business and, and it was, um, you know, it, it was huge, you know. So, um, and, and many of the fishermen sold to more than one of these fish buyers, uh, you know, because they could get a better price and from one or the other, depending on what, what the day was. And they could also get credit because everything, of course, everything they got from groceries to shoes to things they needed to build their homes or fish houses, they ordered from these, these fish companies, you know? So everything was, and nothing was, no money was ever trans, you know, didn't transpire. It was kind of like at the end of the year, they settled up with how much fish they sold to the fish companies versus what they, they got back in credit. Uh, the big steamship companies um, didn't really like when, when herring became dominant in the 1907, 1910 era, because they, like, they, they had been you know, pretty much only dealing with trout and whitefish on the South Shore primarily. Uh, and they just felt herring took up more space and it wasn't worth as much, you know? And this gave this mosquito fleet the opportunity, of course, to, to make good money on that. Um, so, you know, again, it was, they could, 
they could maneuver better. Uh, the people didn't have to roll out on a on a schedule uh, defined by the big fish companies. Um, so there's a lot of lot of freedom in that. Um, the, as you can see, the the Grace J there on the lower uh, left hand side, it can come literally right up next to shore or right up next to the fish house. Uh, and and they weren't on a schedule. They would they would wait for the fishermen. That's one thing the fishermen didn't like was that. These steamships kept a tight schedule, you know, rightfully so. But, um, and then this is just an uh, uh, an example of uh, the the steamer Goldish, which was one of the one of the Mosquito Fleet members. Um, in a tape I I, I recorded, um, where he said, you know, from Duluth to Tofty, he would make three hundred and fifty seven stops at fishing places. Um, to pick up fish, and and typically by the time he got to Lutzen or Tofty, uh, he would have to turn around and go back. You know, so again, there were a lot of people in this business. You know, um, I'm gonna move on a little bit just so I don't run over here. But the you know the fish houses um, were in every nook and cranny, as you can appreciate, um, and then, and in our shores, not forgiving for where fish houses can be placed, <laughs> but um, you know there were an awful lot of fish houses. So there are very few, if any, there's one in Tofty, Chris Tormanson's that I can think of and, and Gadeen's is still there. But I go up and down the North Shore a lot looking you know, for, for fish houses. And one thing unique about the Scott fish house is that it, it kind of sits in a bay and, that, and that's really unique. Most of the fish houses have been battered by the sea, you know, open to the whole lake. Um, and you know that's helped you know preserve somewhat the the Scott fish house in particular, I guess. Um, then again, we said there was over 400 individual fishermen, but the thing about the the numbers is that we, you know the licenses for fishermen in 1943 were 312, and 1945 it was like 390 something, but that really wasn't representative because. Um, most of the fishermen would say they would hire hands in the fall, you know, primarily when the herring runs were on. They'd hire four or five people that were not licensed people, but were yet were still working in the fishing industry. So everybody agrees that it's, it's quite an underestimate of how many people were working, um, you know, in in this industry at that time. Then, uh, you know, the uh, the fish trucking. Um, started up once the road on the North Shore was opened up in the mid 20s, you know, 1925, 26. And, um, you know, they weren't any longer dependent on weather, you know, which was always a problem to get out to the steamships. A lot of times the steamships wouldn't even stop. They would keep going if it was bad weather and left the fishermen. Um, and it just dramatically changed the lifestyle of the, of the North Shore residents to have a road, obviously, and have these fish trucks coming to pick up, um, their fish right from their fish house. Um, you know, the road also brought tourism, which ended up many, many commercial fishing families ended up building uh, cabins. You know, in fact, I, in my opinion, the majority of the resorts today are were founded by commercial fishermen who started cabins. And of course, we still have quite a few on the North Shore that are and are still run by those same families. But that's, the road provided that. You know, and the Scott Fish House was in a perfect position <laughs> it was close to the, the highway. I could just back down, pick up their fish. But again, it changed a lot um, in respect to commercial fish. And then, you know, Jim Scott, who built the fish house in 1907, uh, you know, he, he did a lot for commercial fishermen on the North Shore. He, he helped organize the North Shore, you know, Cooperative Fishermen's Association, which was, a, you know, fishermen that got together to <clears throat> try to, you know, outdo the fish buyers. And he also started, helped start the North Shore Fish and Freight Trucking Association, which we see a couple of pictures here. And he served as president and director of those um, associations. So, you know, he was a, you know, pretty influential and important person in, in regards to commercial fishing on the North Shore. Then in the, in the, 30s, you know, the, it's interesting, there was a law 
that the Minnesota fishermen had passed that wouldn't allow a boat on the North Shore of Lake Superior to be bigger than 35 foot in length. And the reason that was, was because the South Shore was over in Bayfield, they would take these large steam tugs and come over on our side, on the Minnesota side, and set miles and miles of, of, of gill net. And, uh, and, and so the fishermen had a law passed where, where there, and I think it's still in place, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure. But there was many um, you know, boats that were built, but uh, all of the boats that we're looking at here, which are Grand Marie area tugs, I, I couldn't find a picture of uh, the deer owned by the Koss family, but you know, they're all in that range, you know? Um, and, and what's important is that, that, that for us is that the Scots who built the Niji, Jim and his son, Roger, it's the only fishing tug you know, built in Cook County. The rest were made over in Michigan, sailed across, or Wisconsin, I think was one. So, you know, we always feel the Niji's got a, uh, is significant in that respect because you can go over the south shore of Lake Superior, Cornucopia in particular, and see, you know, tons of <laughs> fish tugs, you know, um, and, and still fishing, you know. So, but to us, the Niji, you know, being built by the Scots in Cook is significant, you know. Then as we move on, um, the lamprey smelt, as you know, is what decimated the lake trout fishing. So lamprey decimated the lake trout fishing. And Dick Eckle, who later uh, owned the Scott Fish, he, they first were lamprey in, in 51 out on Isle Royale. You know, with all of the boat um, more lamprey. Everybody was what happened that quickly, you know. Um, hear me? Yeah, Brian, it sounds like you're cutting out a little bit. Um, oh. I don't know if, you're, if your connection is uh, is a little bit unstable right now. Um, I, I also only got that window showing that it's rooting or something. Let's say it's unstable. I don't know why, but. I'll continue on until you tell me. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting would, close. Uh, if you would share your screen again, I think it might have cut out. I don't, I don't know about everybody else, but I, I kind of lost it right around when you started talking about the lamprey. Let's see. I'm trying to get back to the session here. Here we go. Hmm. Yeah, I'm on the Zoom, but let me let me escape out of this just for a minute. We'll give Brian a chance to uh, um, yeah. start sharing his screen again, and and uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a better connection for him to finish his talk. Yeah, I'm not getting the controls um, to be able to reshare. I have the Zoom meeting. Um, hmm. It's actually asking me to sign in at this point, but you can still hear me, right? Yep, we can still hear you. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say. I, I'm I I see the Zoom window, but I can't. There's no controls for me to get back in. We could do one of two things. Um, Pat, did you get my presentation? Is it something you could? Yeah, let me. Uh, what I'll do is I'll try sharing my screen and getting to that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. 
it asked me to sign in or join a meeting and I don't want to do that. So, or leave webinar, which I don't want to do. I'm getting close to the end anyway, but that's too bad. Actually, even if you share, I'm not sure I'll be able to, if you could just talk about screen it on so I could speak to it, but. All right, so we are, uh, we are now at the lamprey and smelt slide, okay. three slides in the end. Thank you. Okay, so that, the, I, I was finishing up on the smelt. The smelt, uh, we said that lamprey decimated the lake trout, but the smelt in turn decimated in large part the herring population, as well as the whitefish and the, they, at first they thought, the scientists thought they were plankton feeders and argued with the fishermen that they, you know, they had no, there's not gonna be a problem, but ultimately the Great Lakes Fishery Commission acknowledged <laughs> that they were decimating the herring populations, which of course, you know, um, then the, when the lake trout started coming back, they started feeding on the smelt and just the whole imbalance was, was horrible. But, you know, so there's a couple, like a double whammy for the fishermen because they lost the lake trout to the um, lamprey and then they lost the herring to the um, smelt. And this happened on all the Great Lakes. It's recorded very well. Let's move on to the next slide. That should be Dick Eckel. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so, we said that that um, Dick was out on Isle Royal fishing, and he had witnessed the, the lamprey, but was not as concerned as he should have been, probably. So in the 50s, um, he started to lease the Scott Fish House and the property. And he also purchased the Niji, the, the boat that we talked about earlier. And it wasn't a few years later that um, the lamprey had, in fact, decimated the lake trout. So he ended up selling the Niji again to his uncle Stanley in, in Duluth, Minnesota um, to fish for now these hordes of smelt that were taking over the lake. So the Niji went to Duluth, um, fished there for many years and then, and then it was put ashore and then the Coconia Historical Society uh, acquired it and, and started to do repairs. We'll go to the next slide. And that should be Harley and Shelley Top. Harley and Shelley, yep. So then um, eventually Dick sold the property into his business partner, Cheryl, par partner Shelley and Harley Tofty in 2005. They did a great job of everything, <laughs> uh, running a business, uh, fish market, and continued commercial fishing. Uh, Harley is noted for uh, caring for and trying to maintain the Scott Fish House throughout those years. Um, and then um, in, in 2018, North House, of course, um, purchased the Scott Fish House and property from the Tofties. So if we go to the next slide, that'll be the last slide. So this slide represents the Scott's family long history in Grand Marais, you know, starting back in the 1870s when Andrew Jackson Scott, you know, first arrived with the uh, Mayhews and the Howensteins. And then of course, the son Jim who built the fish house in 1907 and all the work they did um, you know, with the fishing associations, and Jim and Jack um, and Ben, part of the family. Uh, so it's just got a tremendously long history and, and some of the earliest uh, commercial fishermen in Grammary. Uh, but I'll stop there just to, <laughs> I don't know how far I've been over. <laughs> Well, thank you, Brian. That was an amazing presentation. Uh, the most comprehensive I've ever heard on, on commercial fishing on the North Shore. And I'm going to now turn it over to Mike Lovato of uh, LHB about the historic structures report. I'm just gonna uh, spotlight you just a sec here. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, everybody, can you see my screen? We sure can. Great. Uh, yeah, first of all, 
Uh, Brian, thank you very much for that, that great setup. There's a, a lot of really interesting stuff in that and I couldn't uh, follow up a better presentation here. So my name is Mike Lovato. I'm a historical architect with LHB and I helped to coordinate the uh, historic structure report that we prepared for the Scott Fish House. Obviously, I didn't do it by myself. Uh, there was a big team of people that went into this. And uh, you know, first and foremost, the North House Folk School with Greg and Matt and, and Libby and, and other folks there. Uh, on our project team, I worked really closely with Amy Lucas, who works for a company called Landscape Research. And she was the primary historian on this project. So she did a lot of the primary research that went into this, the first part of the report. Uh, Phil Waz, the project manager, and he was my boss on this. Uh, Worked closely with a structural engineer named Dean Smith and with an electrical engineer named David Williams to sort of put everything together. Uh, many of you might know what a historic structures report is, but I figured I'd better talk about that a little bit just so I uh, get that background. So a historic structures report is a very specific type of document that was codified by the National Park Service in the early 2000s uh, to sort of be the primary historic preservation planning tool for, for historic resources. And what it does is it combines a really thorough look at uh, the history and context in which the building was developed in. And then it provides uh, you know, maintenance recommendations and, and repair recommendations. And then it provides uh, options for the future of the building as well. And so as, as Brian mentioned in his presentation, the North House Folk School just recently acquired this, this the property, much larger property that contained this historic building on it. Uh, and that is why they brought us in to help them try to figure out what, uh, what the best way to treat this building is. So anyway, uh, Brian did a great job talking about the history of the Scots and, and the Fish House, but I'll just sort of recap a little bit just to give myself a foundation here. So that's Jim Scott. He built the Fish House in 1907 and early on in, in his tenure here at the Fish House, he was partnered with a guy named Eugene Clark, and they ran the Fish House and the neighboring properties that were associated successfully until Jim Scott died in 1947, and the property uh, was then rented, as he mentioned, to Dick Eckel, who, who operated out of there for you know, much of the 20th century until he purchased it from the Scotts the family, the Scott family in 2000, and then sold it to his business partners, the, the Toffees in 2005. Um, and I just like this photo. This is the earliest sort of best photo that we have of the fish house there on the left. This is a picture of Jim Scott from 1937. And uh, that's the boathouse in the back. Uh, Brian showed us a photo of the Niji coming out of that earlier in this presentation. Uh, so I should say, you know, one of the things that we use the historic structures for, report for is 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 um, uh, an important tool in historic preservation planning is, is what we call a period of significance, and and that means what was the time frame during which this historic resource was was sort of being used for its historic purpose, and you know when. And we know that this building is historic. In 1986, they put it on the National Register of Historic Places, but they didn't really give us a, a, a historic. Uh, period of significance at that point. So one of our tasks with this project was to figure out what the period of significance was. And, and you know, by the end of the project, we had sort of decided it was 1907 when it was built until 1947 when uh, Jim Scott died. Because, you know, even though they've been using it, you know, to this, you know, not you know, to very recently for fishing purposes, uh, that was sort of the heyday. And, and his death, death in 1947, allegedly at the fish house, fish house uh, really coincided with uh, that decline in fishing on the North Shore that, that Brian mentioned with the lamprey and the smelt. So we thought that 1947 would be the appropriate period of significance. And what that does is it allows us to sort of judge if something, you know, if something happened after 1947, then we, we can say that it's not really contributing to the historic resource. And so we look at the fish house and we say, it has a sheet metal roof on it. And we want to replace the roof is that roof from 1947 or, or, or earlier, or is it from later? And in this case, it's, it's much later. So we, we know that we don't have to match that. When we go back, we can look to see what might've been on earlier and try to do that, or, or we can you know, choose our own, our own path there. But it's just, a, that's an important part of that tool. And, and one thing that we sort of thought a lot about is there's a little addition on the back. Of, so, so I should say, this is a 1942 uh, plat map that was a really useful tool for us when we were doing this work. And this very, this is the fish house in question here. 
And it really close, clearly shows this addition that was built in 1942. So we were able to determine that that addition is actually contributing to the historic resource because it falls within the, the, uh, the period of significance there. And, and just thought you know, if you're, you know, I'm sure many people here have been to the North House Folk School. So I, I thought I'd sort of just give you an orientation on, on what was at the site and, and where this fish house is. So this is the fish house right here. This is sort of the admin building here for the folk school. Uh, you know, the red building is a, is a shop building. Uh, this is the North House Folk School Fish House, which is a classroom building and is not the fish house that we're talking about. Uh, that I believe is, is right here. This is about where that red building is. This is about where the admin building is. And, and this is our fish house. Uh, this is the boathouse that had the Niji in it. Right over here is about where the, the, the angry child is today. So that's sort of the lay of the land. And, and as it is, the fish house is sort of sort of tucked away in a, in a sort of backup house location right now. And, and you could probably go to the fish house or not, you could go to the North House Folk School a million times and not quite, quite realize it was down there if you weren't looking for it. Um, the other sort of interesting part about the building there is, is, is the relationship of the fish house to the dressing house. And, and you can see the dressing house here um, on this map. And then that's the one associated with the fish house. And my understanding is that the, when they came back from fishing, they would they bring the boat up to the dressing house and they would do a lot of the nasty uh, sort of fish processing there at the dressing house. And then the fish house itself was really used for more storage or packing or things like that. And, and the dressing house is, is what saw a lot of the action back in the day. And so I like this photo from 1937 where you're seeing the WPA uh, building the breakwater there along the harbor. But you also see that's, that's, that's the boathouse, the big one right there. But you can see the dressing house there for the the uh, the the Scott Fish House, and then in 1938 there was a big storm and it basically destroyed everything that's in the water here. And so by 1951, which is when this photo, sort of iconic photo of the Fish House was taken, they had and, and this is a 56 photo looking the other direction. That's what you had for a dressing house there in 56, and then in 1958 there was another giant storm and it destroyed all that stuff, which is now gone. Uh, you know, all the dressing house and the dock and everything. So, and then all that is to say that, you know, the fish house is, is sat, you know, on a harbor, but 30 feet away from the harbor, away from Lake Superior for over a hundred years. And, you know, all the associated structures have been destroyed many times over. And it's sort of a miracle that today, uh, the building basically stands as it, Oh, you know, as far as we can tell, at least until the 30s, it built 1907. Obviously, there was 30, 40 years before we have you know, great photos of it, but basically stands today as it, it is, as it's always stood. And so there it is in 1956 or 51 on the left and, and basically today on the right. And obviously, you know, the, the, sh the cedar shingles are in a little worse shape and some of the glass is missing from the, the windows there. And that, the, the first floor window is missing entirely, but but as I've looked at these photos a lot and compared them. And as far as I can tell, those are the same wood shingles. That's the same door. Uh, that's the same window frame at the second floor there. Uh, it, it's really sort of incredible how sort of close this thing is to Lake Superior and how, how good a condition it is till, to this day. Um, and just, just to show you all the sides of the fish house, uh, I should mention in the 70s, uh, Dick Eckel built, a, a, and I don't know if you call it a dressing house or a fish house or, or what it is exactly, but that's that structure on the top left there. He built that in 1970-ish. Uh, for his fishing operation and that's still used to this day for fishing. Uh, they have a dock there that they still fish off of. Um, so that's that's the south view that faces the harbor there. Uh, the north you can see that little addition that was built in you know probably the mid 30s. Uh, uh, west view and, and the, the east view there are very very simple structure but sturdy and still standing. Here's what it looks like on the interior. Uh, the, the top is sort of coming in through that front door and, and looking down the length of that main space there. And then, you know, this is on the opposite side, looking back towards the main door. And I should say that we don't have a lot of information on what this thing looked like, say around 1999 or, or, or before uh, Har the Harley and Shelley Tofty bought the property. But we do know that they did an, uh, an incredible amount of work. And I think it's pretty safe to say that it, this building may be a pile of sticks today if they hadn't have done such great work early, you know, about 20 years ago. They put in these these uh, beams and columns here. I, I believe they did the floor then. Uh, they they jacked the thing up on uh, 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 on new foundations, 
and they put the new roof on. So uh, that, that's a that's a lot of work and a good reason why the building is in such good shape today. But as you can see, you know, it's all peeled pole wood framing and peeled pole joists, and all that is just resting on a one by five, uh, one by five header over there. It's pretty simple, but it's it's not failing. It's in good condition and and standing strong today. And this is just what's inside that uh, shed in the back. You can see that uh, early on they they had to use peel peel pole framing, but by the time you know in 1907 that's what they had. But by the time in the 30s when they they built the addition in the back, then they had uh, they just used dimension lumber here. So old, but definitely more readily available materials at that point. And this is upstairs. There's a loft level upstairs, and the top is, is sort of looking back and forth and, and on the right on the top you're looking towards a, a living quarters uh, and that's inside that living quarters and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and this is just an overview of what the plan looks like. Main space on the bottom, there's a stair up to the loft at the top right there, shed addition. There is a small privy at the, the top left there that sort of hanging off of the addition. And then there's the living quarters on the up, upper floor. And so I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, generally in, in pretty good condition, considering where it is and, and how long it's been there. But obviously, you know, the most noticeable thing is, is sort of the advanced deterioration of those wood cedar shingles on the exterior. And this is just a little comparison. So on the left here, you see a close up view of what those cedar shingles look like on the outside. And on the right here, because there was an addition built in, the, in we believe in the mid thirties here on the back, they covered up a bunch of those exposed uh, exposed shingles on this side. And so in that area, you can still see those shingles which have not been exposed to the weather for the last uh, you know, 80 years and, and they are in perfect condition. And we love to find this kind of stuff because that tells us you know, exactly what those wood shingles are supposed to look like when they're in good condition. You know, we can see the saw marks on them. We know for sure they're shingles and not hand split shakes. Uh, shingles being uh, saw on, not, not split. Um, uh, we can see roughly what the widths were. We can see what the exposure is, the dimension here, and we can, you know, we get a good, good example of exactly what those are supposed to look like if you ever want to go back and reclad them. Um, some other, you know, minor sort of just I put this one on the right just to show another example of, you know, really how good a condition this framing still still is in. Uh, evidently, and we believe this is some. This is on the loft level. You can see how the framing comes up and, and just hits the roof there. Uh, Evidently, there was probably some water damage that, that predates the roof that went in about 20 years ago. Uh, the roof must have been in pretty bad shape then and water was getting into the building and causing this kind of damage. But I think this damage has been stabilized and besides for looking bad now, it's, it's, um, it's not causing any more problems in the building. Uh, windows are obviously in, in sort of pretty bad condition. This one on the left is on the west side. Uh, you can see the, the casing is in, you know, at the top is probably beyond repair. We, we always like to repair instead of replace things when we can, but I, I think even this window, which is probably the best of the lot, is, is probably missing too much material to be repaired. But the fact that it's there means we can, we can at least study it and look at the profiles. And when we do rebuild it, we can match it pretty closely, which is what, what we always try to do. Uh, this is the window on the opposite side, which is obviously in less good condition. Um, but you know, getting new windows back in there is 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 in making sure that this thing is watertight is pretty essential to making sure it, it stays in good condition going forward. This is just another example of sort of what you know being exposed to the weather can do to wood over the years. Uh, this is the main door on the left, and as far as I can tell, it's at least been there since the 50s in that photograph. Uh, probably a lot longer than that. It's still in remarkably good condition, but you can see there's a lot of material missing from that just from the elements over the years. Um, let you know allegedly the stories we heard were you know this thing would sink uh the the building itself would kind of sink over the years and they would just take this door and lop off the bottom and put it back on so it's apparently gotten a little bit shorter over the years but uh and then on the right is the door to the living quarters and you know that could have been put in there last year and that doesn't get a lot of light it doesn't get a lot of exposure but it's a good example of, of what your building envelope is doing for you uh, the other real main concern in the side of this building is is sort of the electrical system. Uh, you know, I think if there is one existential uh, uh, main existential uh, threat to this building, it, it's probably some sort of electrical failure that could bring the whole thing down. Um, there's definitely, you know, there you can see the knob and tube wiring here, which has been disconnected. But this wiring, this is still the original or 
very old fuse box and and some very old looking wiring coming into that fuse box and and lots of stuff going everywhere so definitely one of our recommendations is to sort of uh, modernize the electrical system in here um and, and back to the living quarters so we it's our understanding that uh scott Jim Scott's partner, Eugene Clark, actually did live in, in this, this room up here, at least you know, for part of the year when the fishing was the most intense. He, he did stay inside this living quarters area. And I uh, just want to point out this sort of uh, water damaged uh, product here. This is a very, you know, a 16th inch paper product. And this is what passed for insulation in a fish, fish house in 1907. Um, there, you know, just off camera left here is a, uh, was a, it's not there anymore, but it was a wood stove. So if you kept that thing going, it was probably pretty cozy in there, but heaven forbid you ever ran out of wood because I'm not sure what you, your R value on this paper is, but they even went so far as to, so in this bottom left picture here, that's your subfloor. And then they did a, put a layer of that paper down on the subfloor and then they put a finished floor over that. So you even had it in the floor, but I'm still not sure that's going to keep you too toasty warm uh, in January in uh, Grand Marais. And then this is a cabinet that's in that living quarters is, and uh, calling it the sort of the cabinet of wonders because I don't think anybody has touched it since 1915 because there's just tons of stuff in it that date to that era. And I'll just go through some of the cool stuff we found a little bit later. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, one of the most fun things about doing this kind of work is finding all those little clues about the past here inside the building. And on the left, you see uh, some uh, a stack of Jim Scott's fishing licenses. You know, earliest one we found was from 34. The latest one was from uh, 1940. And here's a, a piece of a crate nailed to the wall, probably blocking for some sort of rack or something. And you can see very clearly on that, it, it was uh, used to go back and forth between the Booth Fisheries Company, which, which Brian talked about earlier in the, um, in the presentation. Uh, and here's some stuff that we found out in the living quarters. This is a, uh, on the wall here is a uh, calendar from 1910 from the Fishing Gazette. Here's uh, some correspondence between Eugene Clark and the Michigan Wheel Company dating from uh, June 16th, 1911. We found this little bottle of Edison brand battery oil, which a little bit of research uh, led to the fact that this particular bottle was made between 1911 and 1915. So we pretty good idea where that bottle's from. And on the fuse box back there, sitting there for I don't know how many decades is a is a uh, is a package of Dodd's kidney pills. And I, I did try for you all to figure out what's in Dodd's kidney pills. And I was unsuccessful, maybe for the best. But I did find this from the 1898 uh, Ann Arbor Argus Democrat. Um, this is from August 8, 1898. A, a Mr. A.S. Chatfield of 816 North Church Street in Ann Arbor says that in August 1896, I had a severe stroke of paralysis. A medical attendance was secured, but the doctors could do nothing for me. My friends thought there was no hope, some friends, but I lingered on. I was advised to try Dodd's kidney pills. I had no hope they would help me, but I got a box. I began to mend immediately. I continued their use, and now I am cured thoroughly. And folks, that is the news. That is not an ad. So, uh, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But that's Dodd Kidney Pills for you. And uh, just I should note that the name of that article is The Doctors Were Startled. Um, so anyway, all joking aside, uh, you know, these things aren't just neat little artifacts. They, they can and do tell us things about the building. Uh, when we look a little closer, and I'll just point out this, this fishing gazette here that's from 1910 is on the wall and, and it is mounted behind uh, knob and tube wiring. And, and you have to assume that nobody would be crazy enough to mount a calendar behind knob and tube wiring. So it's pretty safe to say that, that the wiring went in, the original electricity went in after 1910. I mean, we probably could have assumed that anyway, but it, it's just one of the clues that we, we sort of use these Sort of seemingly random things to help out tell a story about the building. And I, I point out the uh, fishing licenses on the wall here. This was in that addition area. So that gave us a kind of a clue about when that addition area went on. Uh, you, you, we could use the dates from those from 1934 to 1940 to tell us when that addition, that, that was a pretty good idea of when that addition went on in the back. Um, here, you know, 
when we after we've looked at the history and we've looked at the condition of the building, we come up with a priority of uh, what items we believe need to be done to maintain the building. And I'll just go through some of the high priority items. We do high priority, medium priority, low priority. I'll go through the high priority items that we found at, at the Scott Fish House. And one was to install gutters and downspouts and then regrade around the base because you know we always want to keep water as far away from the building as possible. Water and buildings, never a good combination. Uh, Reclad the exterior. That uh, Those cedar shingles have done a noble, noble job for the last Hundred or so years, but you know they are no longer functioning correctly, and we need to reclad the building. Uh, the rafter ends are, in, in some cases, in pretty bad. The exposed rafter ends on the outside are in pretty bad shape, so you they have to go through and uh, fix those with an epoxy or or sort of lop them off and splice on new ones if it's bad enough. Uh, our structural engineer did find that the east and west walls were bowing a little bit, and he believes that the roof structure itself is sort of pressing down on those walls and pushing them outward. So he had some ideas about how we could improve the framing a little bit to sort of tuck those back in and keep it from uh, splaying out anymore. Obviously, as I said before, you got to re rehabilitate and restore those windows, uh, replace the electrical uh, systems, and and really document and catalog everything that's still in the building you know there's a lot of stuff in there that's been changing and changed out and, and some of it doesn't a lot of it doesn't date from the historic period but we should document and, and photograph and, and catalog everything that still remains in the building because it you know it, it's told us a little bit about the building but we never know what someone down the road is going to see and what period you know what dot the lines they're going to be able to connect with the things they see that we don't necessarily see today. So we really should document everything that we find in there so somebody else can use that down the way. And the last step of the process is to, you know, really confer with, with their client, in this case, the North House Folk School, understand what their intentions are and, and understand how they align with what we see is the best and highest purpose for this building going forward. Uh, you know, this is, you know, the, the North House Folk School didn't purchase this lot of land because it had a historic resource on it, but it, it does, and they want to be good stewards for that, that building. So we went through and, and kind of broke down three options and some pros and cons that they can look at when, uh, you know, uh, assessing their options. And the first one is a preservation approach. And what that, that basically takes all our recommendations, implements them, and leaves the building as it is in the place that it is. And, and the pros on that are it's sort of the least detrimental to the integrity of the historic resource. It's it's there, it's doing what it's always done, and it will continue to do that. Uh, that will allow you to continue to pursue funding from the Minnesota Historical Society for you know design and, and construction projects going forward with this historic resource. And it's it's not no cost and it's not cheap, but it's it's relatively low cost. Uh, you, you are an organization that that does does hands-on work so it's possible you could you know implement some sort of curriculum that involves work on this building uh and 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 to sort of do the things that we need to do cons are you know it's not a it's not a practical building really for the fish house to use it's, it's a good use for, yeah they don't need that space as storage and and it's it's you know, they're not a museum, they're not a uh, interpretive center, so that's not really in their purview. And as it is, and as it has been for the last 20 or 30 or years or however long, uh, you know, there's little opportunity for public engagement with the historic resource. It's sort of at the back of house uh, area on the campus and, and, you know, if it's continued to use, be used as it is, it will probably remain that way. The second option would be to rehabilitate the building into something else. Uh, it could be rehabilitated into a classroom or studio space. Um, and, and what that would do is it would leave it, the siding and the exterior of the building would rel remain relatively unchanged and would be able to preserve that historic integrity. But the way that the Minnesota building code works with historic buildings and with existing buildings is if, if you leave the use alone and you don't change the use too much, uh, you can get away with you know, leaving buildings as they are. But if you change the use, then it, it, it you know, kicks in a lot of building codes that you wouldn't kick in other, otherwise. And, and you know, if you're trying to use this building 24 or 12 months out of the year, also comfort would play a huge factor. You'd probably end up having to uh, put a lot of you know insulation and, and chipboard and things like that would really change the character of the building on the inside. And, and at the end of the day, you wouldn't end up with a whole, it's not that big of a building, you wouldn't end up 
with a whole lot more space than you had to begin with, and, and you would spend a lot of money. So the cons are uh, you would severely damage the historic integrity of the interior of the building and it'd be pro prohibitively expensive for the amount of classroom space gained. Um, and the last option is relocation. Uh, and with that, you could re retain a lot of the historic integrity. Uh, you it would, the exterior of the building would remain the same. The interior of the building could remain the same. You could put it in a spot that would be a much better location to interpret the building. Uh, you could put it near the water. You could, you know, you can't, you know, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be here anymore, but it would still be near the water. So you would have that relationship that would, you know, that meets the folk school's best needs for that area. And your, your public engagement with the historic resource would be improved. I mean, the big con on this one is that you've completely uh, cut it off from its original, the integrity of the original site. Uh, and, you, you know, you may lose your National Register of Historic Places uh, uh, um, recognition with that move. And, and not only is that, you know, it's a bummer to lose that recognition, but it also means you would never be able to apply for, you know, preservation tax, tax money or, or, or grants for that anymore. And, and those are sort of the options that we came up that, that doesn't necessarily mean those are the only options or that we have a, you know, we're not necessarily recommending one over the other, but, you know, there, it's a good starting point for this conversation to continue. And with that, I will, uh, I will turn it back over to the folk school. All right, Mike. Thanks for that presentation. Uh, if you would um, stop sharing your screen, we can see all the panelists. Thank you. Okay, um, before we start kind of our Q&A section of the presentation, I would invite folks to add any questions that they might have for either Brian, Mike, or both, or uh, Greg or Katie as well. Um, and I think, well, questions kind of come rolling in, I would invite uh, Greg to say a few words kind of about what North House's approach is with the Scott Fish House right now and kind of what the plan is for the immediate future. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And thanks to, to Brian and to Mike and to everybody for being here. This is a great, um, really great to listen to uh, about, you know, it's an important part of uh, the history of our community and this region and uh, good things. Um, you know, as Mike's underscored, um, since North House bought the property, we've been working pretty hard trying to understand the fish house and its historic nature and, and doing due diligence, thinking about its future, even as we, as we think about ours. Um, and I want to thank Katie and the rest of the Historical Society for, you know, being, being a, a good neighbor as we've worked through that in a lot of conversations and stuff like that. Um, Definitely, I think North House has three thoughts um, about the structure. One, um, you know, f first, finalizing the historic structure report is a really important part of what happens. We're in the final stages of that. We have to submit the report and for it to get engaged and approved and reviewed. Um, and so obviously any real formal decision we make is, is kind of guided by that. And so we'll be looking at that. two, um, you know, we think that uh, the, the fish house is a really important part of the story of our community. And um, one, it needs to be restored. It needs work. Thank goodness Harley and Shelley have kept it standing, but it needs work. So it needs that. But, but we also believe it is hidden on our campus. And, um, you know, and that's too bad because it's a great part of the story. Um, so North House and uh, Cook County Historical Society, of, uh, the board of directors have worked together to draft a, a letter of intent uh, transferring the building ownership to the historical society and st studying or advancing the plan to move the structure to a new location that we collaboratively design and then launch into restoration. Um, you know, there are examples of buildings, historic buildings being moved and staying on the historic registry. Obviously, you got to do it really right if you're going to make that happen. So, um, and we can't assume that will happen. Um, but that's, that's, um, we imagine that is the route we're going to take, provided, again, 
but we first need to see the HSR process through. So I wanted to answer that important question about the future of the building and how the Historical Society and North House are working together. But now I'm sure there's lots of questions. And um, so I'll step aside and let, let questions come in for Mike um, and Brian you know, and or Katie and I. Well, one question came in from Anonymous that uh, they pointed out that it, it seems unfair potentially that historical funding wouldn't be available for a structure to be moved like this. Um, can the Historical Society respond to, is, is there funding available for the NIGI? I don't know if you uh, have an answer for that, Katie. We have been working on finding some funding sources to uh, do some restoration work on the NIGI. Um, we have applied uh, most recently for a coastal zone management um, grant, and we're waiting to hear on that. There, there are certain funding sources. I'm not sure of um, exactly if what all is available, but um, there are definitely uh, sources available. But uh, it's not in the same classification as the Scott Fish House at this time. And I, and I would like to point out that it does. It's not a guarantee that, like like Greg said, you know, some buildings have been moved and have been able to keep their historic status. So it's, it's not a guarantee that moving the building would necessarily make it ineligible for historic funding. It's just, you know, we wanted to make sure that we understood the pros and the cons, and that is definitely a con that could happen if it's moved. Probably a question for Mike. Uh, can the structure survive being moved in your uh, professional opinion? The short answer is yes. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's gonna be easy, but, uh, and, and, you know, in our report, we go into a little bit more detail about what you would need to do to do that. But, you know, you have to put in some temporary uh, structural shoring and, and then you can basically pick the whole thing up and put it, probably put it on a barge because you're probably going to take it from somewhere in the water to somewhere else on the water uh, and, and move it in that way. But, you know, it's, it's not easy, but I, we do believe that it can be done. Uh, I would, you know, hardly lifted the building. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how he did that, but that was not probably very easy and, and that's been done. So it, it's, you know, it's a sturdy building and I think, you know, with a little care and a little attention to detail, uh, it can be successfully moved. I invite anybody else to add questions. Uh, we still certainly have um, some time available. Uh, one, one question was, is there any evidence of fish houses like the Scott Fish House being moved in the past? And I'll, I will say that we we did look into that when we were doing the, Amy in particular looked into that when we were doing the historic research for this project. And I don't think she was able to determine any, any concrete examples of when that happened, but you know, with, with sort of agricultural, you know, agricultural out outbuilding buildings, you know, a hundred years ago got moved all the time. I mean, it, it was very common, you know, materials are scarce. So, you know, very few things got thrown away. So if there was an opportunity to reuse things, people usually did, uh, but we didn't find any specific examples of that in the past. Uh, this is a question for Greg, um, and I'm gonna actually broaden it a little bit. The question is, would traditional fishing techniques, nets, equipment be offered as a class, but I'll expand it to what class opportunities might be available uh, with the Scott Fish House uh, and restoration? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I, um, I think there's a number of course opportunities um, that where North House, uh, you know, one of the things I love about North House as a school is that our campus has in part emerged through the, you know, the hands of students, right? Um, Wood-fired brick bread ovens, timbered entries, blacksmith shops, um, blacksmith forges. I mean, right? People breathe life into things they care about. And um, you could imagine um, a group of students working with an instructor, and we have a number of instructors who have, you know, specialize in historic restoration, being part of splitting shingles and residing the building. Um, and, you know, what a, what a great way to forge a connection between a community and, and its history, uh, you know, or, um, you know, or learning about ma making historic windows. I mean, it's there. Should we, should we hit the water and, and head out to harvest fish? Uh, um, 
all we need is an instructor who and, and a fisherman who wants to wants to take us on that adventure. I mean, I think it'd be a great piece um, to, to Grand Marais story. I mean, it, it's fishing is such a part of our history over the over the eons, you know, with a lot of different cultural connections. And it would be great to to bring that forward. I, I think we're intrigued with how, how that can fit. Obviously, first, we need to figure out um, yeah, the journey, the journey forward in terms of what comes next for the building, though. We had an attendee interested in Brian's kind of reaction to the idea of uh, potentially moving the fish house, but then also uh, reactions to uh, or, or some commentary about the Niji and what the significance of the small fish house at the west end of the small harbor is. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think a lot about the, I mean, in my lifetime, I've seen a lot of buildings, you know, move, torn down, in particular fish houses. Um, but I agree that it's in such a hidden place, you know, kind of as the Niji is now, it, it's, it, it's kind of hard to find, you know, I don't know how many people go see it. Um, so I don't know if I can answer, because um, at my heart, you know, wants to say, keep everything the way it is and that, but I, I guess I, I've, I've come to the conclusion that um, unless you could, you know, use it as a, a vehicle to further educate people, um, I don't know if it would be such a bad thing to move it, to be honest. Um, that, that's my gut feeling. I don't know if that answers. Oh, and then the, what, the Niji, I'm sorry, what was the question about the Niji? I think the uh, the question about the Niji was the small fish house next to the Niji that's used as a more of an interpretation. Uh, what's the history of that building? Um, I, I have to let know. I have to let Katie. I know who built it and all that, but I have to let Katie. I wasn't involved at that time, um, but you know, uh, one of the, one of the thoughts was you know um, many times fish houses were you know close to each other um, that that type of thing. But um, Katie, I'll have to let you answer that because I wasn't. Um, around at that time. The, 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 yeah. I can tell you what I know. I, I forget exactly when it was built. It was, it was, I was told it was the first designed fish house. Usually they just built them, but they actually made a design. Um, members of the Historical Society Board, I believe, designed the fish house and they wanted a fish house to be um, correctly placed down on the water. So they want to build a replica and uh, they they just went to work and um, it's down there um, in Parks and Rec land um, by the Recreation Park. Um, that's about all I know. It's got a lot a lot of history in there, a lot of pictures of uh, fishing families and artifacts, and um, it gets a lot of attendance uh, in the warmer months. This is probably a question for Katie or Brian. Uh, are there any other fish houses on the North Shore that have been restored or repurposed particularly well? If so, if so, what was done? Well, you know, I can say that most of the fish houses, because how close they are to the water, um, were were bought for the purpose of building around it, so they could have a cabin or a home um, close to the lake, because they're still using some of the original, you know foundation or wood or whatever but um, you know generally fish houses were were you know used just for the for the purpose and there wasn't uh, you know much need to fix them up I, I can think of a couple examples I guess um, in Lake County where um, they've worked on their fish houses over time um, but you know, I think generally they're just falling and you know they, they did their job I guess is the point you know yeah I, I do want to say one thing too that um, you know it, the North Shore Commercial Fishing Museum is designed after the twin fish houses that my grandfather and, and his brother and his um, brother-in-law fished out of. So, um, you know, that, that brings some satisfaction to our family because, it, you know, it's got the same design, the same, and then of course what we tried to do inside was make it the best we could from what we knew, but I wished I would have had Mike around to, <laughs> to do the integrity work uh, or the, dis the discovery on that before it got torn down, which was many years ago. But yeah, no, I, I don't think, um, 
you know, they really, it, it fit its purpose. And I can't think of anybody outside of a couple in Lake County that have kept them up. You know, this phase at Split Rock Cabin are one, I guess, and the mid broads. Um, but those were just, you know, similar to what was done to the sky fish house over the years, just, you know, they're still fishing. So they want to, you know, have, keep it up, upgraded, you know. But I've seen more fish houses built into homes or cabins than I have seen any work done to maintain them. You know? This might be a good question to start to wrap up. And like I said, if anybody's got any more questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A. Uh, does the Historical Society have a, a plan for how the fish house would be used? Uh, as far as we've determined so far, um, it would be used mainly just as an interpretive site. I'm not sure, um, depending on where it can eventually be located and um, to what extent it's just kind of preserved or restored. Um, most likely, would you just kind of be exterior um, interpretive panels and located close to the water in a safer spot. Um, I know there was some talk of, you know, possibly having some classes. I'm not sure. It just depends on whether people can be inside of it or, or not. Yeah, and we just had a, a, a question kind of come in as a comment that, that, you know, one thing that was noted was how protected the site was that it currently rests on. Um, it seems like there have been some some sites, potential future sites that have been proposed, um, and and some of those may be even better suited to protect the fish house. Katie, do you want to mention a little bit about potential sites uh, for the fish house? Another question was about whether or not the fish house would land on North House property, other North House property, um, you know, different site on the same area that it is right now. Um, so start with Katie and maybe move to Greg. At this time, we only have kind of one potential site for the fish house, which would be located um, south of the Coast Guard um, house. It's still in discussion. Um, it's kind of where the Yacht Club um, has their dock and, and ramp and everything. Um, it would be kind of part in that parking lot area, somewhat protected um, from the lake and, um, you know, facing the harbor and just, again, just kind of some interpretive elements around it. Uh, that is the only spot at this time that we, we are looking at, um, but we're still, it's still, there's still a lot of discussion about the project. Yeah, and you know, the, um... You know, North House's belief is if the building gets moved, you know, that it should be, uh, ideally be moved to a piece, piece of property where historically fish houses would have been. I mean, that's, um, it's not, that it's not where the house, house the fish house started, but it's still in appropriately, um, in appropriate space for this, for a story to be told. And so, um, uh, you know, is, is move, moving it up the hill and parking it you know, parking it next to the green building. Uh, it's, well, it's a place to store it, but that's not, that's not where the building's future should be. And so, I, I, and I don't think there's any reason to try to move the building twice if we don't have to, right? Um, the, the goal is to find a new home for the building and get it moved and get it moved in and in a place where in a sense, it, you know, it, it finds its second home. And, you know, if, if, if we move and, and so it's not on our campus, um, we need our campus to power our mission. And so if we kept the building, it, it wouldn't be the historic fish house and, and it wouldn't tell the stories that it could tell if it got moved someplace else. And so that's, we need our property to power our mission and teach students and, and w we want to. Um, and the Historical Society, again, our, our intent is to figure out a way to work together so the building has a future and so its story can be told and shared, shared with the world. And the belief is that's that's, someplace around the Grand Marais Harbor, but not where it is now. That's, again, if we moved it, that's the, the assumption. One of the attendees was curious about uh, why not just move it near the Niji? And uh, my impression, and Katie, you can, um, you know, 
comment on this is that the the need both the Niji and the the smaller replica fish house will move in the near future. Is that true? Uh, that is still um, being discussed as well. Um, they are uh, the park and rec um, department is putting together kind of a more master plan, and we may be what's there now may be grandfathered into that. Uh, that's not a sure thing. Um, but at this time, uh, we're not going to be adding anything additional to it. That's not something that's that's feasible at this time. So that was not that that's not an option for the Scott Fish House. And then, Mike, I think another question for you is uh, why is moving a, a building like this even an option or considered as an option um, uh, for the treatment of a building, uh, historic building? Why is it? Con uh, I would say because, you know, I think that there is still value in having the building uh, exist, even if it can't be in the location that it is in now. Uh, I, I, mean, I, said, I, don't, I think it's a fairly no brainer that we'd still want the building to exist, even if it's not in its current location. Uh, you know, it, we try not to do that. It's not an option we like to do often, but it, it's it's better than not having the building. And this, this final question actually has nothing to do with the site of the building, but uh, one of the attendees is interested back to what Brian was talking about, the smelt, and what contributed to the final decline in the smelt populations. Yeah, as, as I mentioned it a little bit, but uh, well, first of all, smelt eat themselves once they've decimated uh, <laughs> other uh, fish. So that's true in Black Bay and other is the Great Lakes. Um, but remember that the lake trout, their primary source of food prior to the smelt was herring. And then the smelt knocked the herring down. And um, then the, the, as a the lake trout were being re rehabilitated, they started to eat the smelt. So for in my world, growing up, fishing out on the big lake, um, you used to go a lot further out uh, to catch lake trout. And then, you know, during my high school years and uh, a little later, um, everybody started catching lake trout closer to shore where the smelt, because the smelt stay in a band of like 150 feet of water. Um, so it was kind of just a um, nothing for the trout to eat. They started to eat the smelt, the smelt uh, where they didn't have herring and lake trout weren't, they, they ate themselves. It's really a crazy scenario, um, but there's many examples of smelt eating other smelt half their size, you know, so. But but there's all kinds of documentation on the Great Lakes um, Commission that shows the, the where herring were declining, smelt were increasing, you know, and then when the smelt um, were decreasing, the herring populations came back. It's just a, a absolutely clear as a bell. Um, you know, graphs showing that. So, yeah. Yeah, right. was, yeah I'll, I'll stop there. Yep. yep. No, go ahead, Brian. No, one of the things that was hard for the commercial fishermen was, again, arguing at that time, you know, with the state that they, you know, were a problem. You know, uh, it went on for years um, where th they weren't interpreted as, you know, being something that could devastate the lake. And again, um, I don't remember what year it was, but the Great Lakes Fishery Commission acknowledged and ultimately apologized uh, for the, and let's say, misunderstanding <laughs> um, you know, to the fishermen. And again, there was overfishing and other things that happened in areas, don't get me wrong, but it's clear, it's clear. I, I think you'll, I mean, I, I've been to um, sport fishing events and presentations where, you know, there'll be, and I was a charter captain myself, so they're begging, you know, to plant smelt, you know, because that's how they, that's what they thought the lake trout, you know, would eat. And of course, everybody that knew the story about the smelt, you know, just cringed because the smelt were introduced um, accidentally, you know. Um, and I, I go back to the very beginning. Uh, There's a guy by the uh, name of Brainbridge Bishop who warned in 1912 that planting smelt into the Great Lakes would be like um, introducing um, a flock of sheep to wolves, you know, so they're warned early on and 
we all make mistakes and we, we didn't, we don't know what caused what at the time, but it's an interesting story for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop there. I think most of the attendees want you to keep going, Brian, but uh, it's probably probably time for us to, to all wrap it up. Um, and I just wanted to uh, say thank you for both all our panelists who, who gave their presentations tonight, uh, Mike and Brian, but then also Katie and Greg for commentary and uh, to all the attendees for, for showing up. Um, we, I wanted to emphasize too that this was uh, made possible in part by funding from the uh, Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's what made the HSR possible. And um, yeah, we're really looking forward to as North House working with the Cook County Historical Society to, to do it right. Yeah, it's a good partnership. Um, so one more time. Oh, uh, Tom Moore says Minnesota Historical Society. Um, uh, he's clarifying that that it's our development director. So uh, development director has the final word on on, on funding. So uh, big thanks to everybody for showing up tonight and uh, special thanks to Brian and Mike for uh, their presentations. Yeah, it's a great building, great project. I really appreciate you guys giving me the chance to talk about it. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yep. Yeah, have a good, good night. night, everybody. Good night.